Welcome to the recorded version of how to select an in-home care provider, part of the Family Caregiver Support webinar series brought to you by the American Society on Aging and a generous sponsorship from Home Instead Senior Care. Our presenters today, Dr. Amy Dupree. Dr. Dupree is the Executive Director of the DAI Foundation, a nonprofit organization established to meet the needs of caregivers. She's also president of Dr. Amy Inc., a company dedicated to family caregiver wellness by providing access to information and education, services, support with emotional and family issues, and legal and financial support. Joining us for the Q&A session today is going to be Deb Norman. Deb is the Strategic Alliances Manager for the Home Instead Senior Care Franchise Network. Her responsibilities include managing partnerships and initiatives with organizations that can help the Home Instead Senior Care Network grow their brand while working together to mutually benefit seniors and their family members. And without any further hesitation, we'd like to turn the floor over to our presenter today, Dr. Amy Dupree. Thanks so much, Steve. I really appreciate it. As uh, if you've been on the call before, many of you know that I began working with seniors and their families over 25 years ago as a home care social worker. I've had many roles since then, but especially in that role as a home care social worker, I've helped families do exactly what we're talking about today, selecting an in-home provider. I also had the opportunity to do this as a family member for my own parents. I arranged their care when they needed assistance in the last years of their life. My mother had home care services for seven years, and she also attended an adult day program, and I'll talk more about both of those later. My father had home care services for the last year of his life. So I've dealt with this topic both as a professional and as a family member, and I'll share some stories today from both of those perspectives. So today, as this slide says, what I'm talking about is really how to recognize and how to help families recognize when in-home care is needed for an aging parent or a relative. Now, just to remind you, this presentation was originally put together for family caregivers, but I think as professionals, we're probably very aware that families are often struggling to provide care on their own and often don't recognize the signs that it's time to bring in some professional support. So in this presentation, I'll focus on how you can support the clients and families that you work with by helping them make decisions about in-home care and selecting a reputable provider. I'm, I'm sure this scenario I'm going to describe will be very familiar to many of you. Think about a daughter who's committed to helping her mom or dad stay in their own home. At first, the parent may just need a little bit of assistance with things like house cleaning or home repairs. Then slowly over time, they start to need help with other things. Maybe it's grocery shopping or cooking or laundry or errands. And what often happens is the daughter keeps taking on more and more responsibility. And of course, she's usually doing this in addition to working and caring for her own children. And we all know that what we often start to see is a caregiver getting more and more exhausted. But she thinks that being a good daughter means that she has to do it all by herself. I really encourage families to think about their role as being the one of making sure their loved one has the best care possible, rather than thinking about it as being the sole provider of the care. And that's often a huge shift for family members because they've bought into that they're supposed to do it all. And I believe often to provide the best care really means a partnership between professionals and the family. Now, even if families agree with this idea of partnership, it's still a big step for families to think about in-home care for their loved ones. I've talked with many family caregivers who tell me, I don't know where to begin. I don't know who I can trust. I'm bringing somebody into my parents' home. You know, I have to feel comfortable about that. And I'm sure you've heard many stories like that too. So during the webinar, what we're gonna go over is how to determine when home care is needed, some pointers on how to have the conversation with older adults about the need for extra care, We'll talk about tips and guidelines for selecting an in-home care provider, as well as about reliable resources for getting more information and for guidance. And this is all information that hopefully will bring it to the surface for you and are things that you can pass on to your clients. Because I know a lot of you have been out in the field for many, many years, and much of this will be familiar. But I think we have to remember the people we work with, for them, it's usually very new. And there's lots of very practical tips and ideas in this presentation that I think you'll want to pass on. So 
when you think about it, all of us are doing probably more than we can humanly do a lot of times. We know intellectually we can't be all things to all people, uh, yet we still often try to do that. And certainly one situation where we see that be true is trying to take care of the day-to-day needs of an elderly parent or spouse or other family member. And I think we really need, as professionals, to encourage family members to avail themselves of professional help to prevent burnout and to help support the entire family system. Many families continue to try to take care of an aging relative all alone because they believe that's what that person wants. And they may be getting that message actually from their aging relative. And we know there are many people who want their families to try to do it all. But I'm sure you'll agree that care decisions that don't take the entire family system into account are less likely to be successful. We live in the context of family, and we need to consider the whole family. I was doing a presentation last evening to a group, and afterwards at the reception had the opportunity to chat with this caregiver who has been caring for her mom for the last six years. Her mom has dementia, and they they have now professional caregivers in, and it's been this, this, as it often is with dementia, a slow decline with many, many more needs. And she and I had a great conversation about the difference with between a marathon and a sprint and that how many people approach caregiving as if it's a sprint and they try to maintain that for what turns out to be a marathon could be years and years and getting people to think about this differently and to think about what skills would you need to run a marathon versus a sprint and how can you do that with caregiving is very different and one of those issues is about bringing in professional help as we know for many seniors it isn't necessary to move out of their home into a nursing home or assisted living. Instead, many people are able to stay in the place they think of as home just with some assistance from professional in-home care providers. So what I'm going to do in this presentation is talk about how you can help family members recognize when home care is needed by giving the warning signs to look for. I'll also give you some pointers you can share with families about how to have constructive conversations about the need for extra care and what roles those professional caregivers can play. And I'll give you some guidelines for families when they're considering an in-home care provider, including looking at the agency and caregiver credentials. And then after that, I'll look at how families can ensure that the decision is as safe as possible and what protections family caregivers should ask about. At the end, we'll look at some resources where you can go and point families to to get more information and guidance. So let's look now about with the signs for when help is needed. So how do you know if an in-home caregiver is needed? If you think about it, it does usually happen in two ways, and these are on the screen, but I want to talk about them a little more. First, the easiest to identify is when there's a medical condition or an emergency that occurs that requires the senior to give up some of all of her, his or her normal activities. I call this the phone call route into caregiving because that's often how it happens. There's something dramatic like a heart attack, a stroke, a fall, a broken hip that leads to a significant change in functioning very quickly. I experienced this route into caregiving with my mother when she had a massive stroke. I received a phone call telling me about her stroke, and three days earlier, I'd been on the phone laughing with my mother. Many people enter caregiving through this route. It's dramatic, and we know at that point help is needed. There's no question. The second way is when family caregivers start to notice signs that demonstrate an inability to take care of regular activities. This is what I call the slow decline route into caregiving, and it's often much more insidious, and families may not even be aware that help is needed in this route. They just start taking on more and more, trying to keep their aging relatives safe and independent, and after a while, it does become hard to do this without professional help. There are a just over a dozen signs that people can look at to say, do I need to think about bringing in professional help? Not all of them need to be present in order to decide to bring somebody in. As a matter of fact, families may say, we have this one need and it's significant enough that we're going to bring in home care. So let's take a look at those exact needs. So here's a whole list of them. And I think the the key here, because I know many of you have been working with families and, and seniors for a long time, The key is to help them learn what to look for when considering if a family member needs help for in-home assistance. And these signs for you are probably very familiar. 
but they may not be familiar to families. And the part that really is significant that families may not understand is the significance of these symptoms. So let's talk about that because I think that's the, the more key part. And we'll, I'll share with you some, some stories from this. So the first one is about balance, right? This, so the question that we want families to ask is, does the person have difficulty walking? Are they unsteady when standing? Have they had a recent fall? We all know the impact of falling. We know it's high percentage of hospitalizations, of nursing home placements. It's often one of the things that leads people to having to leave their home. And a lot of times, families don't realize how significant it is. They're concerned, but until something major happens, they don't realize what this could mean for their family member. The second one is about grooming and hygiene. So how is their grooming and hygiene? Are they wearing soiled clothes? Are they not shaving or showering as often? I think of this as one of the first signs often that someone needs help. And as you know, there can be many reasons for people to be in this position. One may be a fear of falling. So a lot of times if seniors only have a shower that's in a bathtub, they may be afraid of getting in that shower, and so they're not bathing as much as they should be. They may also be having vision issues, so they can't see that their clothes are dirty. They're not aware their, their sense of smell isn't as good. They're not aware that, that they're starting to develop a body odor. Uh, a lot of times there may be a cognitive issue attached to these things. But often it is something as simple as fear or as vision. The next one is about eating and cooking habits. So are there changes in eating or cooking habits? Are they still well, eating well, or are they suffering from some loss of appetite? This is often something that occurs slowly over time, and it can occur for many reasons. People may be having trouble standing to be in the kitchen to prepare food. They may be having trouble getting out to shop. They may just miss eating with the person they've eaten with for years. And again, vision issues can really impact this. I saw this with my father. My father had macular degeneration that was fairly significant. He was able to continue to function, but it impacted his safety at home in many ways. And I was fortunate because my father was cognitively fine despite having this, this visual issue. And I know one of the things that I dealt with with him was safety in the kitchen. And my father had a, my parents at this point had an extremely small kitchen in a senior residence. And in order to compensate for not having countertop space, my father went out and bought a glass cutting board to put over the uh, gas oven burners, the gas stove burners, so that he had more space to prepare food. Well, because of his vision issues, he three times turned on the gas stove and blew up the cutting boards. And after the third, unfortunately, he was not in the kitchen any time that happened, but he forgot that the cutting board was on top. He could no longer see it and then turned on the stove, walked out of the room, and the cutting boards blew up. So when I visited, my dad and I were, were very close, and I was very open. The third time it happened, and he told me, I said, okay, Dad, that's three times. I don't think we should push it a fourth. And he said, I completely agree with you. So he went out and bought a wooden cutting board that he put on top. And the next time I visited, that I noticed that cutting board was quite charred on the bottom. So, again, I had to talk to him about that. Significant safety issue in the kitchen that was really caused by his vision problems. So again, I think those things are things that people don't always think about. The fridge, another issue in the kitchen, of course, is looking in the refrigerator. How's the food? Is it spoiled? Is it outdated? Is there much food in the house at all that's nutritious? Another issue is people leaving things out on counters and not realizing it. And of course, vision problems and cognitive issues can contribute to this. And I remember in the early days of, of my career, when I was doing home care social work, going to someone's house who, again, had significant vision issues as well as mobility issues, and many, there were many uh, food items that should have been in the refrigerator that she was leaving out on the counter. So milk was spoiled. Uh, she was leaving out things that were actually quite dangerous to leave out on the counter, and it was not just causing an issue with her eating. It was also causing a problem with uh, bug infestation. So those are key signs that people really need some help in the house. How's their driving? Do they suffer from diminished driving skills? Have they told you about recent accidents, accidents or near misses? We all know the issue around driving, and we could do a whole other seminar on driving, but this is often something that triggers people to need some help. And unfortunately, many people 
leave their homes prematurely when they have this problem instead of bringing in some help where they could still maintain their independence and get out in the community. Similar to that issue is looking at are they still participating in activities they once enjoyed or have they lost interest or are they reluctant to go out and socialize? That could be about driving, could be about balance, or it could be simply shyness or more seriously, obviously, it could be cognitive issues. Do they have con difficulty concentrating? Are they exhibiting poor judgment? Do they show signs of memory loss or forgetfulness or confusion? Again, cognitive issues, often for many people. Medication. Medication is one of the key things that we have to look at. So looking if people, if they're taking medications, are both getting the refills on time and then taking the medications properly. And I'm sure if we open up this line, we could talk for days about all the stories we know of people who've had medication mismanagement for a variety of reasons. Again, seeing this both professionally and personally, in a professional situation, there was a woman I knew who was, was able to live on her own, fine, except she could not manage her medications in the sense that she kept confusing her daytime and her nighttime medications. And so family members would come visit and they would find her sound asleep during the day because she was taking her nighttime medications, which did include a sleeping medication. And so they brought somebody in just to help with that so that she could maintain her independence. I saw this again with my father with his macular degeneration. My father was taking 15 pills a day. And by the way, he was very healthy right up to the last year of his life. But some of those pills were, were quite uh, powerful. And he was taking seven in the morning and eight at night. And when I was with my father and he took the pills, almost never did he have the right number of pills for morning and night when I was there. He was setting up his own pill containers. He was able to manage this fairly well. But because of his vision issues and because he had very poor fine motor skills, he had a hard time managing those medications. So when I would watch him take the pills, and he would often miss his mouth with one and not know it, and it would land on the floor. So I'm not sure he ever got the right number of pills on any given day. And when I used to visit with my dog, the first thing I would do when I visited my parents was get down on the floor and go throughout his apartment picking up all the pills so that my dog wasn't eating his heart medication. So this is a really serious issue around medication management. And then, of course, signs around sleeping more, lacking energy, talking about being constantly tired, um, mood changes, so irritability or having sudden mood changes are things to look at. And then things like unopened mail, past due bills, bank statements not being handled. Again, this could be vision issues. It could be cognitive shifts. And looking at ho housekeeping and home maintenance. Are they getting it done or are things really in need of some care? And again, I see that along with the personal grooming as often early signs that people are starting to have problems. So I think it's key for us to really look at these. So encouraging families to look at these signs, and again, the reason I took time and went over those is because I think it's so key for us to share with families what those signs may mean, because it may not be evident to families. So if families notice the signs and they want to bring in some extra help, often they're not even aware that there's help available to handle many of these roles that we're talking about here. So let's just take a look at some of them. And, and uh, the adult daycare and respite care, I find that people still are not aware that these services often exist. Uh, I began working with adult day programs in the mid 80s, and I was actually uh, as part, working as part of a grant to oversee a number of these programs. And I can remember in their early stages, these being so impressed about what these programs meant for families. Fast forward a number of years, my own mother attended an adult day program for about five or six of the, of the seven years she was home. And as a family member, I can attest to that this helped keep my mother independent, living with my father along with the home care. She was in a daycare program from nine to three every day. For her, it meant socialization. It meant that she was getting, she was safe, that she had people around her. And of course, the benefits to my dad was that he got a break for a number of hours a day. And so it allowed them to continue to maintain some semblance of normalcy during a time period where she was quite disabled and he was trying to manage things. So I think we really have to encourage families to look at the adult day care option in conjunction with home care because the two really do go hand in hand. And obviously respite care to help family members 
get a break so that they can continue in their role is key. We made sure my father had respite care every year so that he had a time that he was away that he could get a break so, again, he could continue in the role of overseeing things. Uh, as we look down that list, companion services, I think people often underestimate how important companion services are for seniors, uh, especially seniors who have been active and out in the community who may now be having trouble driving or not as mobile as they used to be. And I think that's one of the best roles that home care services can provide. Often they come in for other things, but I think it's often the companion services that helps with the quality of life for family members. And again, looking through that list, uh, one that I would just say that's kind of embedded in this but isn't said uh, completely is the medication management. And often that is simply just handing people their pills or allowing them standing there while somebody picks up their pills and making sure they take the right ones. It's often nothing more than that but it can mean the difference between taking medication correctly and not taking it correctly. And then obviously the other roles such as home house cleaning and homemaker services and meal prep and personal care, very key to keeping people at home. I think we have to help families understand that it's everything from bill payment to home safety so that they know that they can get everything they need for their family member at home if they're living in a place where there's services available. So after deciding that in-home care is needed and knowing what they want, the next step that I think we have to help families with is how to have the conversation about what they've noticed around the house and how to talk to their aging relative about some of these professional in-home caregiving services and how it could help the situation. And we all know that this is not an easy conversation and talking to seniors about this can be very difficult and families often struggle. So I think the first thing we need to do is talk with family members about encouraging them to try to move towards solutions that provide maximum amount of independence for the older person. And approaching it from that standpoint and conveying it to the senior is really key. So again, the first thing is about maximizing the independence. The second thing we can encourage family members to do is to look for answers that optimize the person's strengths and compensate for problems. So again, reassuring the aging relative, we'll say a parent in this case, mom, my goal is to help you stay independent and to help find a solution so that we can take care of the things that you don't want to have to deal with anymore so that you can do what you want to do with your time and stay in your home. I heard somebody last night call this the reverse bucket list, getting people to stop doing things that they no longer want to be doing. I love that term and I thought it was a great way to approach it, to think about it that way. So, you know, you've earned the right to not have to clean the house anymore. Let's talk about how you get some help with that so you can do more of the things you want and stay here. Again, optimizing strength, compensating for problems. The third important part of this approach is about being respectful and not patronizing. And frankly, I think this is where families probably struggle the most, is in having the conversation, not taking on a tone, not taking on uh, an aggressive stance, not trying to push their way. Often I suggest to families, and I'm sure you do too, that it's important for them to put themselves in their parents' shoes and think about how they would want to be addressed in this situation. I often will say to people, imagine right now that you had to have one of your family members, if you have a, a child or someone or a friend, come talk to you about needing help with things or about not driving. How would you feel if I said to you, I think that maybe you need to think about stop drive, stopping driving right now? And, of course, people say, well, it would be ridiculous because I don't need to do that right now. And I say that's how your parent often feels when you're having that conversation. They still feel that way. They may be 85 or 90, and they think that this is probably a ridiculous conversation that you think they need to bring help into the home. So you need to remember that in, when you talk to them. I really believe that the reason family members often take on this stance of becoming patronizing and uh, perhaps aggressive in how they're approaching it is based on fear. Oftentimes they're very concerned about their aging relative and what's coming across is their fear, but it's coming across in a more aggressive way. So I think it's really key for us to help families understand how to do this conversation calmly and with great respect. 
Another point here is I think family members need to remember that not everything has to be solved right away. Often there are multiple things going on and it becomes overwhelming to try to deal with those all at once. So this is really about prioritizing what needs to be dealt with first. And of course, we all know safety issues are the things that must be dealt with first. And then after doing that, before they have the conversation, to really think about the timing of the conversation. It's important not to have this when people are very stressed out, when people are distracted. Uh, the end of the day is usually not the time to do this. Or if you're out running errands in a busy place, probably not the time to do it, or watching some favorite TV show. This is about being very conscious and helping families think about what time are they going to have this conversation. So let me just summarize those points I think we need to share with family members. Maximize independence, optimize strengths, comp slash compensate for problems. Be respectful in their tone and in their stance. Prioritize what needs to be done and think about the timing. Once the family has had the conversation, and hopefully the senior has agreed to in-home care or at least giving it a try, then I think what's next? Where do families start? What questions should they ask? So let's take a look at that now. So there are more than 5,000 senior home care agencies nationwide. You can imagine that's pretty overwhelming to people. And the first step in finding in-home care is obviously to pull together a list of local care providers. So where do families go to do that? Well, there are local phone books if people still use those. Getting referrals from the local senior center or elder center or going online where there are a number of reputable services. And you see two listed right there for search for local agencies. Eldercare.gov is fabulous, as is N4A.org. So two great places to start looking for services. So now once the family has the name of several providers, they're going to want to learn more about their services and their reputations. So it's a good idea for the family member who is taking this on, who's in charge of it, to really create something like a notebook for this task, something that perhaps has pockets where they can put in pamphlets and other information and where they can really keep the notes in one, side, one place for the rest of the family members to really be able to review it because otherwise it becomes a very disorganized task. So then the first question they want to ask each provider is very simply, how long have you been around? How long have you been serving this community? Many in-home care service providers are national companies and they have franchise offices around the country. So it's important to know both how long the parent company's been around, if there is one, and how long has this local office been in business. As you might guess, the longer people have been around, the more likely they're providing quality care. The next thing families want to do is ask about licensure. They want to look at accreditations, certifications, that whole area. Some states require business certificates and licensure, but as you probably know, there's no national licensure requirements for non-medical senior home care. There are, however, a number of accrediting agencies from which companies can seek to get certified, licensed, or accredited. So the most, some of the most popular and reputable of those are the Accreditation Commission for Healthcare, Inc., the Community Health Accreditation Program, the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, the National Private Duty Association, and Home Care University. So assuming they've gone through this and they've gathered the accreditation information, families should then ask the provider if they have any detailed literature that explains its services, the eligibility requirements, the fees, and the funding sources. Many providers will furnish patients with a detailed patient bill of rights that will outline, obviously, the rights and responsibilities for the provider, the patient, and caregivers, all of those. And they may have an annual report and other educational materials that would have really helpful information about the provider. If the family feels the agency's kind of past that mark, then they want to move into looking at personnel policies. And this is really key. So they want to know what kind, what kind of insurances do you carry for the people who work with you? In most cases, caregivers are employees, so this means the agency is responsible for paying the employee payroll tax as it's required by law. But you want to check, and we want to encourage families to check, if they carry workman's compensation insurance, general liability insurance, if they have bond insurance for their caregivers. This is part of the benefits in working with a credible home care company, 
And so we need to encourage families to take advantage of those benefits. The last item to check from the agency credential standpoint are about the service agreements and financial policies and billing procedures. Families really should get copies, sample copies of written agreements and invoices. They should understand this whole process. They should inquire if the provider furnishes written statements which explain all of the costs and if there, there are payment plan options associated with the home care. They should also ask their provider and their insurance company what services will and won't be covered by the seniors' medical and long-term care insurance. Better for them to know all that ahead of time because many times families are surprised and not in a pleasant way in this situation. So now that I've gone through the agency questions, the next step if they pass through this is to know about the employees themselves. So let's take a look at that. So let's assume the families narrowed down the list of potential in-home care providers based just on the agency credentials. Now it's time to find out about the actual caregivers themselves. And I'm sure, like me, you've seen some negative situations around people hiring caregivers where it hasn't gone well because they haven't checked their credentials. So I'm, I'm afraid that that's more common than we'd like it to be. People may have misrepresented their abilities, they may have not been open about um, some legal issues that they've had, and then the family ends up having a negative experience. And that can range anywhere from perhaps it being where the person isn't as well protected as they would have liked, isn't as safe, they feel their family member's been neglected, or something's been stolen. So it's really key to look at how the agency manages this. So the first step in this is obviously to ask the agency, hey, how do you select your caregivers? Do you base your employment decisions on experience, education, qualifications, or is there something else? So for example, the Home Instead Senior Care Franchise Network looks for people that have a passion to help seniors live independently. That's one of their key requirements. Then each potential caregiver must complete, successfully complete a thorough personal and professional reference and criminal background check. So those are key things to be looking for. Next, we wanna know who's supervising, who's watching over the caregivers. Does this provider assign supervisors to oversee the quality of care patients are receiving in their homes? If so, how often do they make visits? This is really important because we know that people are in people's homes working independently, so there need to be some checks on the supervision. Families should also ask, are there any regular reports made from the supervisor, such as changes that may need to be made to the caregiving plan? As you know, in many cases, close bonds really develop between the senior and the caregiver. And that's something that you can share with families about being one of the great benefits of accessing these services. The caregiver often learns what the senior likes, doesn't like, smooth transitions that might happen as the person allows someone else to do things for them. It's very key because of this relationship that there's really a consistency in caregiving staff. Some agencies, including Home Instead, employ a caregiver team approach. That way, if one caregiver is sick, another is normally available to meet the home care needs of the family. Having a team also means that the most compatible and reliable caregiver will be there for the family or friend. And I really experienced this in my own life with my mother, and it made such a huge difference in the quality of my, both of my parents' lives. We were very fortunate to have two caregivers who took care of my mother for the last three years of her life, these two women managed all of the care morning and evening and never missed a day. They operated as a team. I was living long distance, and in a lot of ways, I relied on them to be my eyes and ears because I was visiting on a very regular basis, but I wasn't there every day like they were. And I knew if there was a change in either of my parents' behavior, care, needs, that they would let me know because they were as invested in my parents, I felt, as I was at that point, to be able to make their lives operate in such a way that they never missed a day in three years was just incredible. They were such an amazing part of the quality of life of my parents, and like many people, I began to feel like they were part of our family. And they both came to my mother's funeral and have stayed in touch with us since. Those are the kind of relationships we know people develop with their caregivers, and it's important that those relationships are, are 
positive that the caregivers are engaged and helping in the right way. And that help it happens when you have a reputable organization that's overseeing them and where there's a care team in place. So I think explaining to families why this is so important will help them understand that it makes sense to check on the caregiver credentials ahead of time and to understand how the provider is dealing with that. So now let's take a look about the safety, rights, and protection issues, because we know, unfortunately, these are more important today probably than ever before. We know that privacy is a big issue today, safety, and that unfortunately more people are taken advantage of than we can probably imagine. And it's especially important to look at this with a vulnerable population such as seniors. So I think we want to say, how can we make this better for seniors? So it's important to make sure that the agency selected pre-screens their employees and conducts criminal background check and drug testing. But that's only the first step, so we have to look at what else can you do. Well, the most important thing is to make sure that the family member who needs care is getting the appropriate level of care. This means that families need to ask, are there any pre-service clinical evaluations done? And if so, are you contacting us? Are you contacting medical care professionals? Who are you consulting with in completing a pre-service clinical evaluation? Of course, we also want to know what are the credentials of the person who's doing that pre-service evaluation? For example, is it a nurse or social worker or therapist? And find out what the evaluation entails so the family members can inform their loved ones about what to expect. And I think that's so key in keeping the, the aging relative completely engaged in this going through the whole process. That's an important thing. Families also will want to make sure that the in-home care provider is taking what I like to think of as a holistic approach, which means that they're ensuring that their services are compatible with other services that may be being provided and not competing with other services that may be provided. They should also ask if family members will be included in this process because nobody understands better what's going on often than the person themselves and their family. Families also need to make sure the care of plan will be provided in writing, so there's some documentation. And the plan really should detail the specific tasks to be carried out by each of the professional caregivers, and a copy should be given to both the senior and a member of the family. Well, families should also want to know, how often is this updated? If a change occurs, what happens? And how do you inform me? So this is about doing appropriate updates and having great communication with the patient and with the family so that everybody knows what's happening when there's a need for a change and how that's responded to. Now, we all know that emergencies happen. They certainly happen in home care. So families need to ask the, the provider, how do you handle emergencies? Are there caregivers available 24 hours a day, seven days a week? And if not, they need to ask for advice for other options, such as personal emergency response systems like Lifeline. And unfortunately, again, we know things sometimes go wrong, and there may be situations when the senior or the family believe that something isn't up to snuff and they really need to fix it. So they need to know who within the, the organization they can contact with questions or concerns and to find out what is the agency's policy for following up and resolving issues, because the last thing you want is an issue just ignored. And the last safety and security question to ask of the in-home provider is about patient confidentiality. Families need to ask for this in writing to guarantee the safety of their senior loved one's personal information. So how are you going to protect my family member's confidentiality? Okay, so now we're at the last step. At this point, the family should have their choices for providers narrowed down to two or three options. The next task is to check references. Families can ask each home care provider to provide a list of references, such as doctors, discharge planners, patients, or other family members or community leaders who might be familiar with the quality of service. And then, obviously, families should contact those people and say, do you frequently refer clients to this provider? Do you have a contractual relationship with this provider? If so, do you require the provider to meet special standards for quality care? What sort of feedback have you gotten? from patients receiving care from this provider, either formally or informally? Do you know of anybody else in a similar situation to me who's used them? Is that a person you could refer me to? That's the formal looking at references. The informal is really to encourage families to ask around, because we all know that when family caregivers start talking to friends and relatives, see what they've heard, good or bad, they'll start hearing things. 
and often that's where you get the most straightforward answers from those services if, or from those sources. If the services have been great, they'll say, yes, it's been great, and if they're not, they will clearly let the family know. You can see here there are many sources of information online to check out organizations. Families can check with local and national consumer protection agencies such as the Better Business Bureau or AARP, American Society on Aging, National Council on Aging, and the National Family Caregivers Association. You know, I think we're all aware that for many families this process of figuring out you need home care and then talking about it with a person and then selecting an in-home care provider may seem quite daunting, but if they go about it in this comprehensive and methodical way, it really means they're much more likely to get the best care for their aging relative. And I think we have a responsibility to help families with this process, to teach them what they need to know so they can ensure the continued independence and quality of, of life for their loved one. So I, I hope you found this presentation helpful. We've obviously gone over a, a lot of information. Again, it's likely for many of you this was a review, but I think it's about us taking it to the next level and how do we teach this in a very simple manner to our, the families and the clients that we work with. So I ask you to think about what's next for you in this. How can you take this information and take it to the next level and share it even more than perhaps you have been now? And I want to thank you for joining the webinar today. I'm going to turn it back to Steve, and we're now going to have a question and answer period. All right, thanks very much, Dr. Amy. Another great presentation. And as you said, it is time to move right over into the Q&A session. Joining us for the Q&A session is going to be Deb Norman, who is the Strategic Alliances Manager for the Home Instead Senior Care Franchise Network, as well as Dr. Amy. And we're going to open up the floor to the questions right now, and we'll, let's uh, jump right into it. Uh, Amy, this question is for you. What would you do in a situation if there is another spouse still living, but they don't want to help but they don't want help with any of these services. They only want a family member to help, and I live far away. <laughs> this is a, a very common scenario, I'm afraid, uh, where oftentimes that uh, people are resistant to someone coming in and they think family should do it, and it's often almost impossible for the family to manage it. I, I would suggest a couple things. I would have, uh, if it's possible, and this all depends on relationship, that you have with this person about sitting down and talking about why it is so difficult for you to do it alone and talking about that the issues and, and how you can't manage this on your own, but that your goal is for, to help maintain their independence, to be there, to make sure that they have the best care possible and you will be part of that, but you can't be the whole part of that. If that doesn't work, because it doesn't always work, the next step sometimes is to bring in a professional. And this could be a geriatric care manager, it could be a social worker, it could be somebody that could sit who is outside the situation, not emotionally involved, who can help really facilitate that conversation and let the person express their concerns. And by the way, let me back up and say it's a good idea in your conversation to ask them what their concerns are to be able to really listen to those and then see if you can help meet those concerns. If you can, again, having a professional come in who can help facilitate this may be really useful in helping the person see it. Oftentimes people take things better from professionals than family members. Uh, I, I've, I often share that I remember early on in, in caring for my own parents and my mother was very disabled and I was helping my father put the, you know, figure out care and do all of that. And my father was kind of questioning me and I laughed and I said, you know, Dad, people actually pay me to do this. And he said, yes, but you're just my daughter. And I think that's a great way, you know, it was a great reminder to me that he was never going to see me as the expert who knew how to do this. I was always going to be the daughter. So you may need to bring in a professional to help with that. Okay. Uh, this question is for Deb. Uh, we were talking a little bit more about uh, selecting the right in-home care provider. But you, could you be more specific on how we can help our clients and their family members choose the right one? Absolutely. Um, Amy presented a lot of great information, and I kind of think the way to think about it is if you almost can focus on five or six key areas. Um, and number one, she talked about, and that's looking for a company that's reputable, that's connected to the community, and not to be afraid to ask for references. We would never think of hiring someone to work for us if we didn't check out their references. So I think that's key. Um, and as she said, ask around, talk to friends and relatives to see what they've heard, good or bad. 
The second area is really all about the caregivers. Um, and here are some of the questions that I would probably ask. Are they, are they actual employees of the agency? Um, find out how they select the caregivers. How do they, do they do behavioral interviewing? Do they do a thorough per, personal and professional reference check? Um, do they conduct criminal background checks? And do they do drug testing? Uh, amazingly enough, not all home care companies do that. That is a standard here now for us at Home Instead that all caregivers go through drug testing upon hire. Um, the third area would be then to ask about the training for those caregivers. At Home Instead, we believe that training all of our caregivers feel strongly about that because it's the only way to ensure quality. Um, we have a very uh, multi-phase training that includes basic care, safety, activities, and advanced care. And this training covers many areas such as recognizing issues and illnesses, Alzheimer's and dementia training, and all the other challenges that may affect seniors. We have more advanced training in the areas of Alzheimer's, hospice, and personal care. And then next is find out who's watching over those caregivers. Do they assign supervisors to oversee the quality of care? How often do they make visits to the home? Um, at Home Instead, we have an ongoing commitment to quality. So in addition to regular QA visits by the local office, we have a quality program in place um, in which we've commissioned J.D. Powers and Associates to routinely survey not only our clients, but also our caregivers to ensure that a high consistency delivery of service throughout all of the homestead offices across the country. And last, find out if the uh, agency offers a, a no-cost in-home care assessment. This is where all those questions that a family or the senior themselves may have can be answered. Everything from what the care is going to be, talking about the caregiver to the, the billing procedures, the finances, all of those things, sitting down face-to-face -face with them, not just a phone call, being in their home, and even doing a home safety check is all a, a very valuable part of getting the service set up and making the senior comfortable. Um, I kind of like to wrap this up by just saying that personally, for me, as I'm getting closer to having to think about a caregiver for my own mother, um, I think the two things that rise to the top for me are her happiness and her safety. And I think all of these things that, that we've talked about today really cover the area of safety. Um, but for the happiness factor, I think it's important to understand how does the agency um, go about selecting the caregiver for my, for my mother? Um, what is their process? You know, I read somewhere that a caregiver's success is not measured by how many tasks he or she performs with your loved one. It's really measured by the strength of the bond that the two of them develop. And at Home Instead, we take the time to match the client with the caregiver based on many criteria such as their education, their hobbies, their interests, their likes and dislikes, because we want the client and the caregiver to be very happy in that situation. And you know what happens is often that uh, blooms into a real friendship, and that's, that's what I would want for my own mother. Okay, great, thank you, Deb. This mm -hmm. question is for Amy, and uh, we've been talking about choosing a caregiver, but uh, this is a similar, but a uh, bit of a different situation. How would you counsel families through a caregiver situation that's not working? Where it's the, that's a hard one for me to answer because I'm not sure. Is it that the the caregiver, uh, just taking a guess here, where it's not working in what way is what I'm trying to figure out. So that they brought somebody in and it's not working. Uh, if that's the situation and they're working with a uh, an agency, they need to get a different caregiver in there. And by the way, I the, the, I talked about my own mother and the caregivers that I had the last few years, it took a while before we got that right. So it wasn't that that magically appeared. Sometimes it does take a couple of different caregivers, and that's why if you're working with a reputable agency, they'll respond to that because they want it to be the best fit. And I love what Deb just said, you know, it's really about that relationship. So, you know, you, you have to make sure the relationship is right. So if that's the issue, which is what I'm guessing this person means, uh, Keep pursuing it. Don't don't stop. Make sure you keep going to you get the right person in there if that's the, the issue. Okay. 
And uh, sort of a follow-up question, a similar question to that for you, Amy. How would you handle a situation if someone is in denial and they don't want anyone to come into their home, outsiders per se? Yeah, that's that, again, very common, unfortunately. Uh, I think this will get easier in uh, as the boomers age because I think we've had a different viewpoint on help uh, than, than today's seniors, but very common. And I really encourage families to... Um, to sit down and again this conversation really needs to be had about what's in the best interest of the family because these decisions are made within a family context so sometimes it's sitting down and being really honest about you know I, I have found seniors will often respond to their concerns of their adult child even though they don't think they need it if you say you know mom I'm really concerned about this and this would really give me peace of mind would you consider it from that standpoint sometimes that'll work Sometimes it's a money issue that people don't want to spend the money. You know, this isn't a generation that's done that as much. And I think you have to lay out, there, you know, I think of all of these conversations on a continuum. And you start at the most gentle end and you, you take the, the, the most gentle approach and then you move up as necessary, especially when there's safety issues, and you start talking about what, what your concerns are about what the negative consequences could be if this doesn't happen. And these are often hard conversations. And again, don't hesitate to bring in a professional to help you have that conversation because I think it's key. I've seen situations where people have kicked out help endlessly or refused help, and it has meant that they've ultimately ended up in assisted living because they've fallen or something has happened. So, I, again, you don't want to start with fear tactics. You don't want to start with an aggressive stance. You start very gently, and then you move up through as need be. Okay. Thanks, Amy. Uh, this question is for Deb. Uh, we have an attendee who was referencing a recent theft in a, a case in Orange County where there was a theft of a large amount of money from a senior from a caregiver. Can you tell us, with your background, is an agency responsible for reimbursing a family for a theft like this? Well, I'll tell you, um, here at Home Instead, all of our um, caregivers are bonded, and so we have that bonding with each one of the caregivers, and they're also all carry, we carry workman's compensation. So those are the things that would cover that type of situation. Okay. Uh, Amy, another question for you, a situation about uh, possibly leading up to choosing a caregiver. Uh, there's a, a group of children in this family, adult children. One child recognizes a problem, but five other siblings are not willing to admit that there is a problem. Do you have any suggestions? <laughs> Yeah, this is. I'm not laughing at the situation. I'm laughing at the um, the commonness of the situation. It's often that some family members see it and some don't. Uh, this requires really good communication, and this is families all have different relationships. Some siblings can sit and really talk about these things easily. Others cannot. And so I think it's again figuring out: Do you need to bring in a professional? And I'm not trying to harp on that. A lot of families can manage it alone, but I also have seen so many situations where if they had had somebody present who could guide the conversation, they could have gotten to a much cleaner, more harmonious position. It's not about making your siblings wrong. It's about taking good care of your family members. So you need to be very concrete. You need to stay out of the emotional as much as possible, give very clear examples, all of those kind of things that keep us from having it, you know, really spiral into an emotional nightmare and, and helping our siblings see it from our viewpoint, from a safety and independence viewpoint of the person we love is the approach that I would suggest. Okay, Amy, great. Could I could I add something to that? Of course. Okay. We actually um, have some great resources that we just developed and just recently rolled out called the 50-50 rule. This is all about siblings. It it's really provides practical support services to develop those open discussions between adult siblings so they can help improve how they communicate with each other, how they develop teamwork, and make decisions together and divide the workload in caring for their aging parents. And I believe everyone can see caregiverstress.com. That all of those tools are available right there that can help with that issue. There's a video and there's um, many other resources that address that issue. And I want to just second that those resources on caregiverstress.com are fabulous. I really encourage people to go there. Yes, as, as both of our presenters just mentioned, you can see some resources up there on your screen. And I see that we are just about out of time for today's presentation. So I, again, I want to thank our two presenters today, Dr. Amy Dupree and Deb Norman, from Home Instead Senior Care. Thank you very much for your, for your presentation today. Pleasure to participate, thank you.
it was it was great. thank you very much.